Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Rugby Bits podcast. And as you can hear, I will be taking the reins yet again. This is a challenging time for Sean <laughs> because uh, we are welcoming two amazing guests and pretty excited to have them on board having um, the Australia Springbok test coming up this weekend. But we are joined by the gents um, in the 8-9 combo. So first up, Brett McKay. Brett is a sports writer, broadcaster, commentator, digital content producer, and much, much more. But we all know Brett is the bridge between Harry Jones and the world. Um, he tries to manage that situation. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is none other than Harry Jones, who's done every single podcast ever that is rugby related. And that's just not in general. That is probably today alone. I know you guys have been pretty busy. Absolutely so, um, spot on. Yeah, Harry, um, welcome, my man. Welcome back. How are you doing? How's it, but I'm surviving. Uh, I'm, I'm living in a, in a rugby world, and I just love every single part of it, as everyone knows. I'm sure, I'm sure. It's been, been exciting. This test match is, we've been waiting patiently. Brett, you're flying solo today as the only Wallaby supporter. I will tell you, um, <laughs> at risk. Like, at the whole world? Or yeah, is there, no, is there more of a somewhere? Definitely for those listening, um, we can start there. But I'll yeah. tell you, at risk of my own uh, my own good health, I, I do quite like the Wallabies and do support them when they're not playing South Africa or, or when it doesn't matter, should I say. Brett, you've had a roller coaster. It has been challenging. And we South Africans can all say that because we went through the, the same shit um, with the Springboks. <laughs> And it does get better. Um, things are always uh, going to look good when when Joe um, takes over. How are you feeling? Uh, yeah, but I mean, you guys won a World Cup with Eddie Jones. We definitely did not do that. So <laughs> you, you know, when you, you say anti- that you've experienced the same you shit, did. we've got we've yeah. got different ideas of what shit is with Eddie Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Eddie Jones. So. For most of the guys that listen to me, I, we were quite favourable. I quite like Eddie Jones. I think the shit that happened at England, I, I'm always. I think Eddie Jones, like Rossi, is very much a World Cup to World Cup man. Like that's his plan. So if you cut him short of a World Cup, you really don't get to see what's best. But when when he then took over Australia, I was like, oh, th- this is actually really good. Like he's got a little bit of time, and it doesn't matter what he does because he can't do wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. And then after that, you've got a Lions tour, and then a World Cup. And I thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then, yeah. Otherwise, how are you feeling about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and look, in 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 fairness, um, I, I think the Australian rugby public, when he came on board, thought. And generally speaking, I think the Australian rugby public would say he did a very, very good job for Australian rugby right up until the point where he started get, started coaching the team. And that's yeah. where it unfortunately unraveled. And it, and it unraveled several times quickly. Um, and it's that, it's that classic old line, Harry, that we, that we speak of um, you know, regularly now, it seems, that, you, that it unraveled quickly and then slowly, <laughs> you know, gradually and then overnight. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, he, he, ch- he changed tax so many times didn't really explain why, you know, he, he started with experience then got rid of experience. Then he went with the young guys and then he was, and then, you know, forget the young guys and forget this world cup. We're actually about the next cup. I was like, well, hang on a minute. We're at this world cup. You can't say forget the world cup when you're at the bloody world cup. So yeah, um, we, Joe Schmidt on the other hand has come in and has just um, breathed. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, a, it's like fresh air at the moment. And so suddenly you know the Australian coach is speaking logically, pragmatically, um, being very frank and open about certain things. He, like he said up, he said up front on Sunday, it's going to be a challenge this rugby championship. There's no questions about it. Um, and so suddenly, we're going into a series, you know, without being told that we're going to win the World Cup in six weeks' time, sort of thing. So it's a very yeah. different feel this time around, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, Harry. The Springboks. I'm struggling to find a worse a worse team in Australia against Australia than the Springboks because we have not won back to back games on Australian soil since. So our second win was in 1993. The one before that was before isolation. So it was like the 70s and then the 90s. 
We are on the verge of equaling that if we win on Saturday, but nothing's a given with Australia. I once took a bet that we were going to beat Australia and Australia and I lost. And since then, <laughs> I learned a very valuable lesson. Harry, it's really hard <laughs> to not think that we're going to win on Saturday, but it is Australia. How, how are you feeling about this? Like The approach seems to be from Rossi and the team very much like you've got to think that you're number two the whole way because we need to go and, and actually finish this off. Yeah, it's, uh, there's something about Australia that does not bring out the best in the box. It's If we're being rational now, instead of being irrational, <laughs> we're going to look at this rivalry as the best. You're going to say this is the the hottest, you know, green versus gold versus gold versus green rivalry that exists. But it's not. Uh, people just will not believe in it. On both sides, Australians don't get uh, hopped up for it as much as they do the Bledisloe, which they lose over and over and over. And the Springboks uh, are always fixated on the All Blacks coming, even though the All Blacks, you know, obviously have much greater margin over us than any other team. So you'd look at this particular rivalry, which is pretty much a home and away series, uh, rivalry, which is actually perfect. You know, we'd think that would spawn a kind of France versus England or England versus Ireland type rivalry, but it doesn't. It might be because of the colors being too similar. It might be because we get poke cock blocked so much times by the Wallabies that we just refuse to <laughs> accept it. We blame the ref and say, no, it was Bryce Lawrence. It wasn't Pocock. But there's something about uh, the Wallabies that can negate the, for us, God-given obvious, you know, superiority. Where is it? It doesn't, it just, it, it vanishes. We get onto the field with Wallabies, and little tiny moments seem to take away all that sound and fury. And then we look at the scoreboard. I'm like, how is this happening to us? It's not right. You know, the, the Australians don't follow proper rugby doctrines. They, uh, <laughs> they like put the ball here in the wrong place. You know, they had the wrong guy with the wrong number on their jersey doing the wrong thing. And it works. I think it's about surprise. I think the Wallabies don't fall into the trap of other teams. I think the Wallabies instinctively know that it's not going to be we have got to have parity up front. And then we're going to, like, they don't do any of that. They say, no, we're not going to do any of that. We're going to actually make everything uncomfortable. Everything's going to be unusual and different. We'll have Taniela Tupo doing no-look passes in the trams, behind his back, through the legs. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> That's the way you play. That's what Ireland's doing right now. Ireland's saying, I'll Andrew Porter you, up, you know, refuse to take the contest. And then you look at the scoreboard, and it's tied at the end. Uh, in a way, you could almost argue that New Zealand is now the one falling into the trap of trying to play bully ball uh, a la England against the box and losing, it's Australia and Ireland that say, no, nah. Joe Schmidt's a canny guy. He's not going to, he's not going to say, I'm going to have, you know, Nick Frost against Ibn Etzebeth in a mano a mano contest. That's not going to happen. He, he's going to say, how can I make, you know, how can I make this thing look uncomfortable for the box? And that's, that's where we're going to be. You can tell, uh, do we have the, do we have the advantage this time around? I'm not going to admit that because we're underdogs forever, but uh, <laughs> on yeah, yeah. paper, are you, are you, on paper. Are you actually going to? Are you actually going to keep up this underdogs thing, even on a South African podcast? On paper, yes. I don't yes, know who. We know, I don't we know, know that who Zane Nongor is. I don't know who Isaac Kali is. I don't know who Matt Fessler is. But they're the favourites. Wallabies. I've got to. I've, I've, got to I've, got to, I've got to give it to him, Shark. He's been. He's been maintaining this. So that the spring spring box are definitely underdogs with a straight face because I've seen him say it all bloody week and it has been impossible not to hear it and not laugh Prohibitive because I know underdogs. he doesn't believe it. Yes. <laughs> that that is that is Rassi Erasmus. That was his master plan forever. It's the only thing that gets the spring box up and the fans. The fans social media is awash with all fans feeling hard done by and then wanting to make it second best. So I'm with you, Harry, you've nailed it. Brett, you will get there. We will, we will convince you eventually. You talk about getting Pocock blocked, but now we got what Hugh Tizano is. He's going to be the new one to come into the mix. I believe he's going to possibly start. There's a whole new underdog tag. We have to bring with some new youngster that's going to dominate us. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna find out um, just how deep or not the back row stocks really are, and I, I've sort of I've touched on that for rugby pass this week that um, things always look really really good until you actually need to test it. <laughs> and yeah. Suddenly it's like, oh, hang on, you know, maybe the ideal replacement for for Fraser McBride if you if you had to miss a couple of games was is, is actually Liam Wright, and and unfortunately he's out as well. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's going to be a big test um, for for the back row. I, I I don't know which way Joe Schmidt's going to go. And listening to him on Sunday 
when he spoke about that very question, I'm not sure at that time that he knew which way he's going to go. I'm sure by now he's got more of an idea and we'll, and we'll see soon enough on, on Thursday which way he goes. But it wouldn't surprise me if it's a bit of a, oh, it's, it's a bit of a mix up type thing. Like it could be a, you know, a, a Tom Hooper or I mentioned, you know, do you like, do you start? Harry Wilson at seven, for example, and get 45 minutes out of him and then bring, you know, Tizano or Luke Reimer, who you guys probably wouldn't know a whole lot about. I don't think he's actually, I don't think he actually played for the Brumbies before the South African teams left Super Rugby. So you guys probably don't know a whole lot about him, but he is, um, like, he is a genuine on-ball specialist in the true you know, David Pocock, George Smith mm. way, um, like led, led super rugby for, for pilfers per 80 minutes, despite being very much a bench player uh, for, for the Brumbies. But he's become, he's become such an important bench weapon for the Brumbies that he can just be thrown into games and just causes just absolute sheer unadulterated breakdown carnage. Um, and it can turn games. It's, it's really, um, it's been really effective. The question then becomes, is he good enough to start a test if he plays off the bench in Super Rugby? And that's and that's why I think it's going to be interesting. Carlo Tizano certainly started plenty of games, most games, in fact, for the Western Force this year. But he's a very different player to Reimer, and he's a very different player to Fraser McWright as well. So uh, I don't know right at this point in time which way Joe Schmidt's going to go. I just have to hope that um, he's seen something special uh, at training over the last week and a bit, and um, and we'll find out soon enough. Yeah, I'm glad you, you touched on that because I, I want to chat about the, the loose trio. And Harry, I'll go to you. Like, So the Springboks have named their squad and we'll just touch on the loose trio now. So we've got Khaleesi, Peter Stefft, Toy, Ulrich Lowe. And then on the bench, we have a whole brand new loose trio of Ben Jason Dixon, Marco van Staden and Kwaka Smith. The plan, obviously, is to run the Wallabies, but they do, as Brett has mentioned, have options and have very good viable options, although not necessarily tested um, at the big time properly just yet. But they have guys that could realistically cause a hassle. I think Russie's worried about that a little bit. Obviously, he wants to dominate things, but what do you think the plan is for Dixon, Van Staden and Smith after after the starting loose trio? It's a very interesting um, loose trio on the bomb squad bench, isn't it? Um, so it's, yes. it's that age-old it, it looks unbalanced of of the barnacle, the limpet, you know, the Wallabies always have this barnacle guy, barnacle bastard who can uh, get onto the ball, you know, <laughs> break 17 laws while he's doing it and, and, and win the match. So he's Rossi saying that's not going to happen to us this time. It's going to be us who gets over the ball at the, in the final quarter, you know, and it's actually interesting to say, if you're the Wallabies selectors now, you're Joe Schmidt, you're saying, so in the final 20 minutes, I've got Marco van Staden, Quacker Smith, Ben Jason Dixon, and I've got Peter Stepp to toy probably still on the field plus uh, marks. Okay, that, that is that is a breakdown fiasco. Um, and and it's Rossi saying to Joe, "Hey Joe, I know that your biggest problem has been with well, the Wallabies is uh, ball pos- possession uh, security, uh, third rock, fourth rock. We're just going to make it an utter nightmare. We're going to do what Ireland did to us, which is final quarter. You cannot go beyond three phases." That's very interesting to me because the bomb squad has been much more about putting two locks on and Ben Jason Dixon's yeah. kind of a lock, but he's not really a lock. And um, he's tall enough to be a lock, but he doesn't, he hasn't, he hasn't eaten enough mini pop in his life. So you think like you'd have to, <laughs> you'd have to really pull up in the next six days. Um, whereas for uh, Australia, they can play a big team. So it's interesting to me, does Joe go big to counter this and say, so we're going to outbox the box or does he go, you know, into the George Smith, um, you know, pooper, scooper, whatever, where I go, you know, open sides everywhere. I don't, I don't know. I, that Brett, that's the big question to me. I think that's what you wrote about is the permutations here are not obvious. No, no, it's, it's really, it's really interesting. And, and I thought it was, it was like yeah, someone like Tom Hooper starting, as, as I say, seems like an obvious fit if you've got concerns about, um, you know, Tizano or Reimer's ability to start. But then <clears throat> Schmidt actually name checks Sarah Uru, mm. who has played a lot of uh, a lot of six and eight and lock for Queensland. 
but played seven, played open side for Australia A last year. So who was a big boy, isn't um, he? I mean, he's he's a side. He is, guy. yeah. He, he's like he he started life as a as a number eight and, and a rangy number eight at that. Tightened up to play six and then tightened up again to play lock. Um, so he's he's sort of he's played four six eight very effectively. Um, so you know he him starting at seven probably wouldn't be that much different size wise to Tom Hooper starting at seven, but then that becomes an interesting mix for, you know, what does line out look like? Um, you know, like I, I'm not sure that, that, that Saru Uru or Tom Hooper for that matter, matter have been, have had a lot of experience being the link man from the top of the line out to the back of the mall. So uh, look, I'm, I'm just, I'm intrigued to see how it goes, and as I say, what it does highlight if there is is if there is one player that Joe Schmidt could not afford to lose in this first brace of tests this year, it's it's absolutely Fraser McWright. Yeah, it's very interesting. The other position, and saying the loose trailer, like, and Brett, I'm going to stay with you. Is eight. So we we haven't yet quite. Um, fixed our Jasper, Visser, Dwayne for Mullen gap. Um, And we obviously are looking to do it. I still think Quacker Smith will get some more time at eight. uh, Russi and the coaching staff for me are very much about trying one or two things, going back, fixing it, coming back, stuff like that. So that running game that you saw in the opening test against Ireland, I believe will, will bring it out in the rugby championship. And I'm, I'm thinking it'll come against New Zealand, but you never know looking at the side, but, I'll Rick Lowe starting at eight, and and I think everyone's quite happy, quite happy with that. The other one for me, like Wallaby eight one, I'm a big fan of is Charlie Kale. He's probably not ready to be starting all the games yet, but he definitely has something about him. And as you mentioned, like what are we going to do? What are the Wallabies going to do? Are they going to be a, fighting fire with fire, or they're just going to bulk up? And I think Charlie Kale is a good shot there. You reckon he's got a chance to make the bench? Charlie, well, no, Charlie Cowell didn't make the the squad um, for, for oh, his first pocket game, that. so so I'm no, sorry. he 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 definitely won't. Um, my my gut feeling is that they'll stick with Harry Wilson and Rob Valentini at six. Um, they played that way for the Portugal uh, Portugal for the Georgia Test. You guys play Portugal, mm. um, uh, and that was Harry Wilson's first test back in a couple of years. His first game back from a broken arm through Super Rugby Pacific as well. Um, and he looked really good. And Valentini is so good a player now that he can switch between six and eight, you know, from one game to the next in, in, yeah. in, in, in games sometimes. And just does both jobs e- equally well. Um, you know, he, there was a period there where, um, he was playing six for the Brumbies and eight for Dave Rennie at the Wallabies, but was actually playing the same game. You know, was eight, was playing exactly the same game, and the and the only difference really was, you know, who was playing the other position. Um, you know, whether it was whether it was Wallabies or Brumbies, but he did the same job. Schmidt's got him playing, and even the Brumbies now have got him playing slightly different in six and eight. He's still that big ball carrier up the middle. But when he does shift to six, he can now play a bit wider if he needs to. And he scored, you know, a good couple of his tries um, in Super Rugby this year, and even a couple of tries in Tests this year, uh, playing that little bit wider. Harry Wilson's a really, really good carrier. He's been one of the leading carriers in Super Rugby for the last couple of years. So um, he's certainly very much a known entity. How he'll go in the face of, you know, a fairly a fairly upfront and in your face box defense is going to be a big test for his his carrying abilities and he, and he certainly has in the past had a tendency to get caught upright which then opens you up for being turned over um but i'll be surprised if schmidt goes away from that and, and the way that his squad has come together i think that's the way he's heading as well because langy gleason from new south wales played the george test but he's not in the squad either so I, I think it's very much leaning towards um harry wilson staying at eight yeah yeah Harry, you mentioned that uh, Peter Steftator will probably be on the field for most of the game. I think I think you're bang on. So our locks, Ibn Etzebeth and Achis Neyman. And then on the bench, we have Ben Jason Dixon, who's like a five and a half. Um, he's kind of a lock, but not kind of a lock. So Peter Steftator would have to be covering five. And we've had a little bit of issues 
come lineouts, come mall time. Um, how are we going to fix it? Everyone, like Achia, obviously wants to cement himself as a first choice and a starting five. He's got a few things that he needs to brush up on. He definitely adds a lot of value, and we've seen it off the bench, and I think that's why everyone kind of gravitates towards him rather being on the bench. We'd rather start with with someone else. But we're going to have our work cut out at lineup time and mall time against the Wallabies. We've got, like, what's your thoughts on that and how we need to unpack it? No, I think you're right. So the Wallabies can put two towers up to def- to contest lineouts. They often do it in Super Rugby. They have to do it against the Kiwis. So they even sometimes can put three people in the air. Sometimes in a if they have a jumper like Kale the back, because they don't have that with Harry Wilson. So you gotta you have to nail your lineouts, or you're going nowhere uh, on SunCorp. Uh, Archie has been, you know, I've been calling for Archie to start uh, for a while. I think he's properly a starter. I think he's. He's been a little bit wasted on the bench uh, with Lewitt out. So I think he's more of the like-for-like like with Lewitt. Lewitt's a good game line runner. Uh, uh, Arche can, can get the call right. Um, he can you know just catch the ball one-handed only. That, don't even try to do two hands. Arche is better when he catches one-handed yeah. um, because then he can do an NFL <laughs> pass to the to Damien and then skip the flop. <laughs> but um, but so, rugby's missing out on that. I'm telling you. I'm ser- seriously. He can. He's up there, and he just looks around and looks like you know the the, the lost Viking alive up in Scandinavia somewhere. Um, I I think that's fine. I think you're right, though. This is a speed team. If I don't know of any any like uh, composition of a six two bench that would bring any more speed than what they've got here. Marco is actually a sneaky speedy guy. Quach is obviously a quick sevens guy. And Ben Jason definitely got the wheels. Uh, I don't think Marks is a slouch. Uh, and Koch is actually sneaky uh, fast as well. So you have, and Koch, I don't know who goes the full 80. It could be low as well. Um, it's not going to be Sia. We know that. Um, but I do think when you look at that, that kind of, that vibe, what Rossi is trying to put on the field, Flannery and, and Tony and Stick is, um, the the whole flip the whole thing on its head. You're not going to tire us out. You're not going to run us around. We're going to run you around. And the vibe, you know, from Australasia. If you look into it, if you talk to a Kiwi or to an Australian, uh, except for someone like Paul Cully, who's watched a lot more South African rugby, they think it's about tiring everyone out. And I, that's not really going to happen to this park bench. This is not a this is not a slow uh, pack of bomb squad coming on. In fact, if you look at who would be the bomb squad for the Wallabies. You would say that Quaja, Marco, and Ben Jason will definitely be quicker than the people they're up against. Um, so I, I think that's really an issue. Um, I, I, it really matters on the carry game, though. Uh, like like Brett yeah. says, Joe, Joe Schmidt needs heavy carriers. So I would say Harry Wilson's the CJ Stander, the guy who's always ready to carry. He, he gets up off the floor. He makes himself yeah. available. He finds the eye of the nine. He, he puts his hand up and he puts himself in the right spot, you know, like a slip fielder in cricket for here's the ball. Come on, let's go. Um, whereas, yeah. and Valentini was the reload, reload guy. So now you got Bobby V and Harry Wilson that solved probably your, that's, that's, you know, that's 25, 30 carries you've got already. And the Schmidt system, you've got to have more than that. You've got to have a hooker carry. You've got to have a prop carry. So it's going to come a lot to on Angus Bell or Tupo, wherever they put in the, on the prop heavy carriers, and then that gets into the issue of who's the stopper. That's where Ben Jason Dixon, hello, here's your time, you know, because can you stop um, these heavy carriers coming across the line? We know Marco can, uh, Quaja cannot. Quaja is there because under the system of, of Tony, you've got Peter Steph in the tram or Ben Jason in the tram, and you've got Sia play, uh, carrying in the left tram. So who's patrolling the middle as your Lucy? That was Quaja. He was able to get side to side. It, the problem is he doesn't know how to stop anyone, you know, head to head. So um, they put him back on the bench, which I think is the proper way to put Quaja because, you know, in the final quarter, it doesn't really matter about stopping someone on the gain line so much. It's finding space. So overall, I'm actually happy. Uh, I think this is probably one of the best uh, experimental teams I've seen. And I'm saying experimental only because of Ben Jason and Sasha. But everything else looks to me like these are the right players to put on the pitch in Suncorp. Yeah, I think if one thing we we know about rugby is we don't know much about rugby when uh, when Rusty's naming sides, we there's options all over the show. And <clears throat> to me, it just looks like um, I think we will, as as per normal, play quite a heavily forward based attack for periods of the first half because when you're naming a six two bench with such a mobile sort of in inverted commas loose trio and other players like Marks Koch, you you're expecting that. 
we are going to empty empty the taps. Um, and for in order for that to happen, you know, we could see Khaleesi and Peter Steff on either side, Ulrich Lowe banking up in the middle to try and balance it, or Lowe and Peter Steff on the trams and Khaleesi in the middle. You never know. True, so true. There, there's lots, lots happening. Like there's lots happening and there are a lot of options, which is probably the most exciting thing in Springbok rugby at the moment. Um, but yeah, Brett, onto the flipping exciting side of things for us South Africans, not so much for you. Sasha Feinberg and Gomazulu earns his first start at 10 in a, a, a monster game. And he's paired up with Reinach. Now, we, I, I was personally hoping Williams got a start. I think his time is coming. It's this year that he will start fighting to get that starting space. But Reinach has done really well um, to still very much be relevant and in the mix. And you can't really fault the two of them. I thought Reinach had a very, very good game against um, Portugal. Like he was just literally running up to the ruck. He wasn't, they didn't really contest much. So he was just passing it on. But the excitement of Reinach and Feinberg and Gomazulu is quite something, even for a non fan as yourself. <laughs> yeah, as, as, as my, yeah, true. And and for someone who will almost certainly butcher his name, as I have been fairly consistently for the last two weeks. So um, <laughs> my apologies, Sasha, for what I'm about to do. Um, this is my first chance to see Feinberg and Gomazulu. Nice. Nailed it. Well played. I'm Nailed getting it. Better. I'm getting better here. <laughs> um, I've, I've not seen a lot of him at all. Um, didn't get to see a lot of um, Stormers games in the Irk this year. So... Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him, but you're right. I, he pairing him with Reinhardt um, looks really oh, almost not not counterintuitive, but um, seems out of whack. They seem like they seem like they should be playing with other sorts of halves, if that makes sense. So, yes. um, and and look, maybe that's part of the the mad science of um, of Rossi. He he just needs. Reinhardt to get there and just get the ball to the young ten and let him and let him take over. So it's a fairly obvious uh, statement of intent. There, it, it tells me the box are going to play a lot wider than perhaps they did against against Ireland. Um, and you know that brings yeah obviously Creel and, and the outside the outside backs into play. So um, I'll be really curious to see how he does go at this level because as I say, we we certainly don't know a lot about him in Australia, but I have a sneak suspicion we're going to um, we're going to find out one way or the other on on Saturday night. Yeah, it's going to be fun and uh, exciting as as anything. He's leapfrogged Manny Libok, so interesting in the URC side of things. Um, Damien Willems, uh, Sasha Feinberg and Gomezulu, Warwick Halant, and uh, Manny Libok are all playing for the Stormers. So Dobbo's got quite a bit of work to do next year because everyone's going to be wanting them to play all over. So mm-hmm. I think um, Feinberg and Gomezulu. So my whole gut feel has been that he's going to be working in the 10 space a little bit more for the spring box, which has clearly come through. But my thought process as to what happens in the future is I don't know. I, I don't think that he, he right now, I don't think he'll be pushed as the out and out 10. I think he will get a look in at 12 and, and well, 15 and possibly 12 as, as we know. And looking at that squad, it's clear that Feynman and Gomazulu and probably Colby are covering 15. Um, and then obviously with Pollard on the bench, Pollard covers 10 and 12. So Feinberg and Gomazulu can cover 12 as well. Um, mm. Interesting, interesting times ahead there. Do you, uh, do you think, do you think, Shucky, it's, it's a case of Rossi saying to John Dobson, this is the bloke I want you to play 10 next year because, because I think he's a test 10. So we actually had this conversation after 2019 uh, about Damien Willemse. Yes. I think yes. because like, was he playing 10? Was he playing 12? Was he playing 15? And then they played, um, they got to play all three of the guys at once. Um, you forced through to injury and then the Stormers went on that run to go and win. So uh, we don't have that sort of relationship. I think it's almost similar in Australia. I don't think that, that, that the head coach has that real tight relationship with, they're super rugby coaches where they're like, mm. listen, he needs to play here kind of kind of situation. So it'll be interesting to see. I'm hoping that'll that'll change because we really do want want someone like Fama Gomazula to play in a position that we're gonna get to see more of him in the future. But when you look at 
in hindsight, you look back at Damien Willemser, the kid is just so supremely talented that what we didn't realize back in 2019 was he can freaking play open side flank for a whole season and still come back and back and play test 15. Like <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's incredible. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's interesting, but I, yeah. Having said that, I really do believe that we're going to see Sasha in a few positions in Test Rugby this year still. Um, I think Lubbock still gets another look in somewhere. And it's it'll be hard for Russi not to have Sasha playing as many games as possible. So Sasha probably goes to Argentina. I'm not sure how they're going to manage his workload, but they've got to do something there. They've got to try him out at 12 with Manny because... The big thing, I think, like, Andre is probably not the best option at 12. I know a lot of people want to see him there. They, they've, we've seen him there a couple of times. So we're kind of looking for a replacement at, at 12 for Damien Delendi in the future. Is Sasha an option there? Or are we going to move Willemse there? Because where Sasha and Damien Willemse play affects a lot of the squad makeup. And mm. they're getting to a place where you've got to start them. Damien Willemse, without a shadow of a doubt, he starts when he's fit, and then you move the rest of the back line accordingly. So, yeah. Harry, I'm yeah, yeah. Your I, yeah, I think so. I think Sasha will, will – it'll be a lot of Vili. So, Vili will be in the red zone, being first receiver a lot, and slot uh, Sasha over. So, you'll get kind of an audition of SFM at 12 for those who want to see that. The difference between the, the model of Valencia, so Valencia definitely is the incumbent 15 now and believes the bench uh, and he's the one in the six, in the seven, one or the six, two. Um, but the difference between Sasha and all these other names we discussed is that he's such a good kicker. Um, he is the goal kicker mm. solution so that you can, you can play with seven, one or six, two. And always, if Sasha is one of those, if he's either in the starting 15 or he's the one in the seven, one, he can kick from 60, uh, how he can kick from 65. He's actually a better kicker than Pollard. And that's saying something. Uh, I'm talking about when the pressure's on. He has that perfect strike. Yeah, he's different from Willemse. Willemse is a decent kicker. Uh, Mani is an okay kicker. He, he has a trouble, you know, when, when it's choke time, uh, crunch time. Sasha looks like he likes the kick. He wants it. He wants it. He wants it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, think that's, I think that's the difference of why... Uh, Sasha's going to be on the field. I think uh, Rossi's probably had a conversation with Mani and said, for the good of the team, for the good of everything, here's what we're doing. Um, I do think pairing up with Kovas is interesting because I think you're saying, sort of like vice presidential, presidential candidates in the US, balance the ticket. <laughs> so you have, you have like Kovas, yeah. he's 34 years old. He's played, in, he's played overseas a lot. He's seen everything with my man, Sasha. And then off the bench, you have, you know, quick, quick, quick Grant uh, with, you know, go slow, uh, Mr. Experience uh, Pollard. I think we'll see Pollard pretty early. And I think you're right. They'll slide Sasha over somewhere else because I think they just want to see the kid in test rugby up against, you know, people like Kellaway and Wright and, and uh, Corabetti. They want to see what that looks like. Um, he's got all the tools, right? Like he's won the genetic lottery. So he, he, he has everything you need. But then you get into test rugby and say, how do you handle when you're supposed to do it? Not when you're the guy who comes out of nowhere and you're like this, you know, the revelation. But how do you do it when you're like Pollard? You have to do it. You come out and you're supposed to do the job. Yeah. What does Sasha look like? So I like, like him starting and putting the pressure back on Pollard <laughs> to pin nail the kick right now. It's very interesting on the second game in Perth is what happens there. You know, is he on a hook? Like you make one mistake and you're out? Or has Rossi said, I'm giving you a couple of matches here? I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I like I like the I like the idea of Pollard sliding to twelve though. That's a throwback to Franz Stein. Yeah, so Exit he kick. played yeah. a couple games at twelve. Um, I, I'm sure he's uh, maybe did not start it, but he he's definitely moved in at twelve. They yeah, floated yeah. that idea, um, but we're in a space now where Andre Pollard at twelve is just not necessary because yes. we have. Willemse, Feinberg and Gumazulu, Delendi and uh, Esterhazen, you know, like, so it's so weird. Like that's how you'll hear South African fan, Springbok fan chatter. And I'm sure most places in the world, it's like, where do they see the weakest space? And I can tell you now, we don't see a weak space at 12. We see a weak space at 13 moving forward. Like we've got another World Cup in Creel and Um, And then after that, we're getting a little nervous, but then Moody's around. 
Um, but 12, I think we pretty sewn up. Now it's just a matter of opinion. Like, do you like the fact that Delendi plays to the ball and sets up a platform? You know, that's just that's just that. Um, yeah, I think I think yeah. the weakness, but, I think the weak point for for Bachland is Hooker because you've got a very injured, often injured Marks at 30 years old and Bongi at 33 who cannot get his shoulders. He cannot, yeah. I'm not sure he can even put his hands above his shoulders anymore. So Hrobalar at 26 with one cap, you know, look for him more on this, on this tour maybe uh, and see who the successor is who can nail line-out throws. And the other thing, and this is going to be very surprising, Brett, is depth at lock. Just because you've got a guy like Salman Murat who's like yeah. trying to figure out is he a line-out caller, is he a shot caller or not. And then who? But who's a scrum lock? Who's a who's you know who's an enforcer lock? That is not obvious when you get you know beyond Arthur yeah. and Eben. Yeah, yeah, we yes, um, yeah. Lou Lu, Lu uh, Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned someone being being injured a lot. Malcolm Marks being you know mm-hmm. injured a lot of late. Lou Diaga feels like he's he's been in that same boat, doesn't he? So yeah, it's it's interesting. We're, we're Harry. We were part of a conversation. Um, only recently talking about uh, New Zealand hookers, and, and it made me think. I wonder who who's actually number three hooker in New Zealand. But the same question applies for South Africa. Mm-hmm. Like if 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 bon, one of Bongi or Malcolm Marks goes down this weekend, who's suddenly next in line, and who's who's the injury cover? Yeah, so that's yeah. that's Hrobs right now. Hrobalar, <laughs> that's yeah. the guy. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we'll see. But he's got one and cap. And Jan Hendrik yeah. Vessels. Yeah. And Jan Hendrik Vessels is clearly putting in a shot. I know he's predominantly used at prop, but he covers hooker as well. I think that's like in in week emergency kind of stuff. But Krobala has to be like nailed on as third choice at the moment. But as you mentioned, Harry, one cap, you know, we've still got to see the the second season blues from we see it so often with players like after they're getting get their shot then they have a have an off season you know i, I don't know yeah so brett brett was interested there... in the, the terminology that i use about swing prop um and and and, <laughs> and so that's I, best know was... what, I know what it means i just i just not heard the term yeah, it, it made him think there was an orgy going on in south africa but um the, so <laughs> so vessels is the the rare example brett of being a swing front rower like john smith like the yeah, the, yeah. the hooker prop uh, both sides uh, player, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah. hundred. And I was actually looking through a whole bunch of things uh, on John Smith recently, and found out how much he he played a, a he almost played a whole year at prop. Yeah, it was a whole year. But there were big wins in that year. We won the rugby championship and the Lions tour that year, if I'm not mistaken, or the year Did after he... we won. Was he was he with the Sharks with them? Did, did he play yes. a lot of prop for the Sharks that year as well? No, uh, I, I, I'm saying that because I don't recall it. Oh, but okay. I don't. I, yeah. I don't. <laughs> no, you sounded so. You had me doubting myself. Sounded so emphatic. Uh, no, it, it did. No. It's actually such a blessing when you can have a player play one, two, or three. Um, he mostly played two or three. Yeah. But still, the the, the 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 things you can do on your bench. Uh, if you could do that, so you can see Rossi's brain turning over here. What if I have a prop who can play hooker and a number nine who can play six? (laughs) I'm telling you, after the first game against Ireland, when we were just Mr. Expansive, I said that we will see a 4-4 bench somewhere in this World Cup cycle. (laughs) I know. (laughs) 4-4. And three of them will be halfbacks, Brett. It'll be like number nine all over the place. (laughs) What's... What's Matt Williams going to ca- kind of carry on about then? <laughs> He's going to shit the bed either way. He will. Do you think? Um, do you think just going back to Locke? Do, do you think Ben Jason Dixon being named in the nineteen jersey and, and he's effectively named three back rowers in his bomb squad on the bench? Do you think that is sort of illustrating the concerns about Locke depth? Um, I, I don't think so. I think what it does say is which we've very clearly a Rusty Rasmus vibe is looking for players to cover multiple positions because yeah, Ben no, Jason yeah. Dixon did well at lock for the Stormers. Mm-hmm. He kind of flew under the radar. He wasn't poor, but when they put him on the side of the scrum, he started just tearing up trees. And I think everyone really sat up and took note when he was, you know, um, when he was, was playing on the side of the scrum. But I think his physical makeup, as Harry says, is, not massively suited to the number five lock. And I think number four is sewn up. So 
either we're going to have two kind of fours, like two four and a half locks playing, and we've just got to get by and work more with Peter Steph to toy on the, on the side. But I don't, I don't know if we're massively in <laughs> trouble at five. I think Listen. we've got fairly good options. They're just not tested yet. Yeah. This this you, this sounds like four iron slash four iron versus hybrid <laughs> club debate. Right. Exactly. Do you do you, do you like? <laughs> it depends, do you, do it you depends like, where you're sitting. What you got to play? Yeah. Do you like yeah. do you like Ruan or uh, Ruben as as uh, as five cover? Because I I've always I thought Ruben van Heerden had one of the great seasons and then got overlooked and I couldn't. I thought he was a shoe in. Yeah. I thought I didn't even mention him when I thought of of players that were going to get a call up because I really thought it was a no brainer. Um, this opens the door for him though because True. he plays four and five. Yeah, like this this yeah. this really opens the door for that number nineteen jumper for for him. But we've also got Ruan Yokir. We've got um, John Klein. Oh, should I forget his name? Ruan. Yeah. Yes, he's he's back at training for Munster, so he's available ish. So yeah, I think there's, like I don't there think three, we, there was three locks on the injured list, wasn't there? And, and, and yes. John Klein was one of yep. them. So remember, there was a time when Lurt Diacha missed out on the World Cup, and we, we thought we were in all the shits in the world. Um, I think we're okay. I, I think Harry, where we will start struggling because I think we can fill gaps. I'm just not sure, as I mentioned, if they tested, but it's post 2025 yes. that if we that we're kind of looking thin now. So that'll be an interesting. And it's about management situation. And it's about play time with each other. So while John Klein's thirty years old, he has seven caps. Uh, Murat is twenty six. He's not that yeah. young. He's got six caps. Uh, so Smostert, the guy that the Irish broke his leg, they broke all of our legs. Uh, Thirty three, seven six that. cap, a lot of mileage. Uh, and then Lewis with the heart, like Lewis got fifty nine caps, and he could have a hundred caps by now if he had stayed healthy because he's this sort of the same age profile as Ibn. I think there is options down the road. I would just say, like, in this particular rugby championship, <laughs> there might be some problems uh, if, you know, one of the other guys go down uh, and locks do tend to get injured. Yeah. Well, I have um, I have four iron and four hybrid in my golf bag, just for the record. <laughs> so, I, I know a guy who plays that's, only that's hybrid. Rossi, like, Rossi, his Rossi. entire bag is hybrid. So that's Rossi. <laughs> we've, never, we've never seen... Brett and Rusty in the same room together. I'm just saying, because uh, that's, yeah. that's I've, 100%. I've never I've never started a broadcast by telling anyone they're a liar, though. <laughs> this is this is <laughs> very true. Right. So back to back to the Springbok squad for the weekend, and a place that I'm actually worried about, um, and that's our back three of Kirtley Aaron, Sitches, and Colby and Villiru. And the reason why I'm saying I'm worried is. All three of them have had and come back very recently from injury and have probably not been their best. And it's kind of overlooked because it's Aaron, Sir Colby and Louis. Like everyone is is happy with that. But we had a couple of guys that are preparing. I mean, I know um, we're going to – like I know my pimpy's there and I know that's quite a controversial – um, player, because obviously Orens is around. It's very, very interesting. But I'm scared about our back three, especially against the Wallabies now. I think Joe Schmidt's going to be looking at that and going to be testing them. That, that's really the situation um, to to test them and see kind of what form they're in. Uh, Brett, are you you reckon there's an option to target them? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Look, it'll it'll be it'll be interesting, and and you know, there's a bit of discussion about what you get with uh, yeah. You know, Marika Kotarbete coming into the Wallaby squad is not for nothing. Like that, Joe Schmidt's not bought him in to not pick him, so he he will he will be on the left wing. It's just a matter of whether there is going to do any tweaking around thirteen and fourteen and fifteen, and I don't think he will. I think it'll be Tom Wright and and, and Andrew Kellaway again, and they. Have, they were they were the form fullbacks, um, not just in Australia, probably in su- in Super Rugby, um, you know, or, or among the best at the very least um, this this year. So, you know, Tom Wright is such a dangerous uh, attacking player, almost almost like Billy Larue back in the same in the same age, like the very very similar action. Now that I think about that, um, Andrew Kellaway is just a really smart footballer, knows where to position himself on the field, has a good kicking game, good clearance game, takes the right option, 
99 times out of 100. Um, Tom Wright, it might only be 88 or 89 times out of, out of 100, and that's always been the, the, the part in his game. He's, but his decision-making this year has been a lot better, and, he, and he's been a more dangerous player because of it, and he's been such an, a vital attacking player for the Brumbies to the point that they have now got more confidence playing off Noel Olaseo at 10, uh, whereas in the, in the past few years they've played a lot more off nine. But they're playing a lot more off Lollaseo at 10 because of Wright's ability to tack out a bit wider and, and create opportunities as well. So that's a long-winded way of saying <clears throat> I'm not sure if the Wallabies' kicking game is going to be good enough to maybe exploit those those back three um, you know, concerns that you, you speak of. And then the question is going to always be how good's your kick chase? Because if you kick chase on Kurtley Harrens in particular uh, and, and Cheslin Colby, if it's it only needs to be half a metre off and they'll be 10 metres away going the opposite direction. So that's I, – I sort of – I see your concerns and raise you counter concerns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I agree with you on your back three. Um, it's a very interesting – so I – I think Marika Korobeti is an incredible winger. I think he reminds me a lot of my Pimpi in that he's a really, yeah. really hard, strong carrier. So he's got that explosiveness. He can, he does have footwork if you need, but unlike Colby and Aaron, say he he will happily put his head down and run over you if he if he yeah. needs to. And I quite like having the balance of of two wingers. So uh, Korobeti, his. Uh, his defensive antics aside, and he's got a bad rep in South Africa because of how he's <laughs> how he's he's managed uh, he's managed that in the past. I think he's dangerous. Andrew Kellaway, I agree, he must play. And I, for one, didn't think Andrew Kellaway would get more than one cap. Uh, I was thought he was lucky to get that one, and then I was proven horribly wrong. <laughs> he's brilliant, and I agree with you. His positioning and how he does things is really good. Like he's technically great. Wright has been interesting because they've moved him around a lot. He's been a slow burn. Like he's been there, he's done good things and he's done poor things and they've moved him around into places and he seems to have really found himself at, at 15. Harry, let's say that that is the back three. It would be hard to argue a, a, another option. What, what else are they going to bring to us? I agree that's the most interesting matchup because it's the most different. I mean, Korobete, yeah. Kellaway, Wright versus uh, the old Fox and the two Lekkerbecks. Uh, that's, a, that's a very weird look. I don't know who wins the aerial battles. I don't think Korobete is very good in the air, by the way. I think that's his one Achilles heel. He's disruptive, though. Yeah, he, but he, he causes yeah. shits in the air. He's the kind of guy, when you're practicing, yeah. he hurts your own, his own players. You know, he's, he's, like a, yes. he's like built of something different, and he's, he's somewhat clumsily. It doesn't make sense. He's like graceful and clumsy at the same time. So I can yeah. imagine him. He's he built can, of he hard can, in the fuck up. Yeah, he, he can get himself <laughs> in. He can get himself into position to genuinely contest the ball in the air with no intention of contesting it. <laughs> right. So, like, <laughs> so if there's going to be a card, no, if there's going to be a card this uh, this week, uh, and Wallabies fans are all too used to them, I actually think it might come from either Wright or Kudrabenti. It's not going to come from Callaway. Um, on the on the South African side, I agree with you that defensively, this is not the best back three, but uh, on attack. Oh my God! I cannot wait to see yeah. you know what really will do with these two guys and with Creel making so many breaks uh, right now under the Tony Brown system because Creel's never had this much ball in his life. Um, so it, it's a matter of putting those. <laughs> that's, what, putting those that's what I've been saying. Putting those grubbers in uh, the Jesse Creel special where you, you make a break and then put the grubber in right away and then you have Lekabex run onto it. Um, that's going to make Corbetti turn and swivel and you know his best defensive is just coming across and, and blitzing you like yes. he's on cocaine. Uh, but if you if you have to make him turn around and pull and push, uh, that's his weakness. Kellaway can do it. Kellaway is yeah. not that quick, but he's so good at knowing where to go that he gets the extra step on you. Um, his position. I, I think it's fascinating. I would think that if if on our side we're saying we want to make Tom Wright the central figure of this match, we want him to be trying to win or lose the match, you know, on his own. And then you might think that Joe Schmidt's thinking the same thing about Billy. <laughs> Like, yeah. let's make yeah. let's make Billy be the you know. Let's see how old he is. And um, if, yeah, if, if the if the if the Wallabies through their defence can can sort of force the box into a 
an approach where where Villy has to get a lot of touches at first or second receiver, then I reckon they'll take that as a win because you know, like it's probably easier to set up your defense for Villy Larue age thirty four or five than it is for a, for a new ten um, like like Feinberg and Gumuzulu. Um, That's very well played, by the so, way. Gumuzulu is sounding really good. I'm getting good at that. I'm really <laughs> twice proud of in a row. I think he walks I'm around really his he walks around his house and he's just saying that all the time now and driving his wife crazy. No, but you have to. <laughs> yeah, Harry, yeah, you have why, to. You want to be able to say it without thinking about it, and it's starting to come starting it's, to come good why, for Brett. It's why I was so disappointed when Manus Labashkachni ins- insisted on just going with Labashain because like Labashain. You know, I've, I have been con- I've been practicing Labashkachni for years with Lappies, so I, like. Don't let me down, Manus. Just let me say it. You would have loved Kheri Hamasais yeah. back in the day. Buxton, <laughs> Buxton, no. Let's let's. Can we talk? Can we talk thirteens? Because you've touched on Jesse yes. Creel there, oh. and and Creel v Creel v Ikitao, I think, is going to be an absolutely fascinating contest because you're you're right Creel's attacking ability is is well known and and all jokes aside he has never seen so much ball at test level as what he's getting at the moment um Ikitao is generally regarded as one of the best defensive centers internationally so you know on one hand they sort of cancel each other out oppositely though Ikitao is no mug in in attack and and his ability to 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 release the likes of you know, Corey Tool on his outside for, for the Brumbies has been a big an, an important part yeah. of their their evolution over the last two years. So his attack is, as I say, is is, is not for nothing. And Creel's d- defense equally, like is there a is there a question mark there? This is, is, is that an opportunity? No. This is the hardest no. this is the hardest part for people who haven't watched Jesse Creel as closely as we have um for the last two years because there's he's the form 13 on defense which is weird for it's weird to, yeah. it's oh, weird wow. it's weird yeah. to say and he's solving the problem of uh spatial awareness with just getting to the man and ball at the same time i think there's uh, if that's a stat out there someone please pull it but he is he's closing down people he's, he's hitting people in the ribs as they yeah. catch the ball and it's uh he's so confident right now um he very much leads the rush doesn't he yeah he he, he comes in yeah, but he yeah. also talks really say so he played 15 a lot uh back in the day he, he was a fullback so he i can remember him playing playing on the wing for the bulls so he's a talker and yeah. and on the field when you especially when you're live you can see how much he's talking to his his wings and organizing them damon doesn't talk at all right he's just a silent killer but um but jesse <laughs> jesse's a yapper he's a he's a chatty guy and so i think well, again, what you bet we've isolated is that's a key matchup. I love that matchup. If, yes. In fact, if I want to yes. watch a matchup off the ball and just say, how's it going? I'm going to watch Jesse and Ikatel. That's going to be great. Mm. It's it's huge. And I'll, I think Jesse Creel, I think Jesse, I'm going to, there's going to be chaos here, but I think Jesse <laughs> Creel has grown, has grown into a better defensive 13 than Lucanio Am was. And Lucanio wasn't around. Yeah. He was there for a very short period of time. But we've come off having one of the greatest visions. He, Lucanya um, almost watches the game from a drone, from an aerial point of view. Like he, <laughs> he sees spaces on attack that, that you, you don't see. It's bizarre. And he was incredible on, um, on defense as well. And everything that we do, the Springboks, they lead, they lead off, off 13 on defense, especially under the Jacques Ninaba defensive set. Yeah. So this is massive. I'm so glad that you were leading with Jesse Creel on attack. So around the world, Jesse Creel's defensive ability, as you said, is not as highly spoken of as his current attacking ability. In South Africa, it's the opposite. Everyone knows that he's good on defense, but they all still want Lukanya Umbach because they don't think Jesse Creel's an attacker. Yeah, and I disagree. Right. I think he's probably the best balanced 13 we have. And it's so hard to say that when we've come off having... Uh, Jacques Fourri and then having like Lucanio Am. But it's going to be huge. So it's Ikita will play 13, eh? Um, I just want to make sure oh, I haven't got that wrong. I'd be I'd be I'd be I'd be highly surprised. Like, Josh Fluke only made his debut in yeah. the Wales test. So I'd be yeah. I'll be absolutely stunned if Ikita doesn't play 13. Ikita likes he I, he often likes a little bit of contact. 
I, I think that's yes. how he, he he likes to get that 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 in your face moment with his opposition opposite number and and then and then he starts working his thing almost like he's got a great like those great kick pass run um players those 10s and 12s like they take contact first and then you you commit to contact and then there's a pass or you do something silly and then there's a kick and Ikitao likes that Creel is up for that all day all day yeah what is going to be interesting is how are the Springboks going to deploy Jesse Creel is Jesse Creel going to be coming off second phase Damien Delendi after crash ball or is Jesse Creel going to be platform that those those are the questions. Yeah, and Tony that and Tony we'll see yeah, Tony Brown seems to be using that differently, um, even from test love to it. test. I love it. Yeah, I, I saw that from uh, from Pretoria to Durban, and Jesse Creel had just as many line breaks. Uh, by the way, Durban uh, didn't finish them, but uh, it was interesting how he kept using him as decoy, as blocker, as inside runner, as against the grain runner. He came. He came up at second and first receiver sometimes. So it was like someone. Yeah. Someone's put a word in the ear uh, for Tony on how to use Dukes and Jesse really differently than before. That's a, it. Reminds me, Harry, of how um, Michael Checker particularly used Tavita Kurundrani. Yeah. Who, 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 who for, a long, for a long time, I I just said he was he was the designated decoy, and it looked like you'd look at the stat sheet and you go. He really only ran three times for four meters. Is that all he did in the game? And then you realize that he also ran twenty-five decoys yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and 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 engaged and engaged defenders for eighty minutes. So, you know, he 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 was probably one of the most dangerous attacking players without the ball. Yeah, what what a player! I'm a massive fan. But just to put things, just to kind of like put a video on what we're chatting everyone and it's easy to get hold of the when when jesse uh, when sia khaleesi put robbie henshaw on his backside twice uh in the in the first test Hmm? twice (laughs) yeah the first the first one when he flew yeah so if you have a look at the phase before okay jesse creel ran a crash ball so he ran that platform setting ball and he runs he's got he's a a massive human but he's a great uh, and aggressive runner too like to have both of them together is great. In that phase where um, where Henshaw gets put on his backside, you watch Jesse is running that option, that same line again, mm. and and Henshaw is on his heels waiting for that because um, yep. Damian Delaney's got the ball and he's got a viable options. When that pass rips behind um, Creel, then Henshaw is late to recover, and that's why when he gets to Khaleesi, he's not set and he flies. Right, and yep. those that's that's what happens and. Rugby forever has been about screwing over your opposition 13 on defense. Because if you screw him over, then more often than not, your back line you is in tatters. Yeah. 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 yeah the, errors, so, the errors at 15, which can be self-inflicted or imposed upon you, like forced errors um, at 13 are more dangerous than any other. Um, you, you, might, yeah. you might could argue something at nine. But at 13, it's just off to the races. I did, it, I did see Tony Brown using same template over and over and over and then deviate. So like a setup that looked the same and then Damien Delende, you know, throwing more passes than he ever has in his life. Um, and then, and then, and then suddenly keeping it, you know, that I think that kind of mix up is what he's uh, exhorting his guys to do. I think he likes working with guys like Sasha, with Mani, with Damien Vilamsa because they're instinctively that way. But I think he's, at, he's also telling guys that don't play that way. Normally you can, and you know you you can afford to make mistakes. You know I'm yucking, I'm I'm having a chat with Rossi in the coaching box. We're laughing. We're doing man bro hugs. So I got your back. You know don't worry about it. Yeah. I think that's like that's sugar candy for a guy like Jesse, who has always thought he was more than we portrayed him to be. I mean, like Brett, there's no one in South African rugby that gets more like typecast than than Jesse Creel. You know you're just a muscle. You know there's no brain in the head. We want Lucanio. Um, and so yeah. I think this is actually the, interesting the, the for him to there, show, like he's got some touches. Yeah, and and the thing there that, I mean, and, and maybe this is the thing that gets forgotten in South Africa. He forced his way back into the spring box, yeah, because of his defence and attack True. ahead of Lukan, look ahead of Lukanyu. Yep. So he's not he's not replaced Lukanyu because he's a lesser player. Yeah, it's true. Soldier in, soldier out. Yeah, That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So. <clears throat> Brett, I'm going to start with you. So 100 Pollard's on the bench. So this is the 14th time in his 78-ish, 77 tests that he 
he's been named on the bench. We all know him as a starter, and it's either starting him or he doesn't really play. It's the same as Manny. Like, that's kind of how we set things up with a 6-2 and a, and a 7-1. What is your perfect world for Andre Pollard as a Wallaby fan? Like, oh, not, when, not, when not do you want playing. to see him on the field? How, no, how do you see this? <laughs> I don't. I want, to, I, want to see him, I want to see him in the stands with his right foot in his <laughs> moon boot, if I'm honest. <laughs> oh. And Company I say that, that and, I'm, and I mean that the nicest possible way. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, oh, yeah, look, <laughs> I don't, to clarify, I don't wish injury on me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, pure irony. <laughs> um, I, th- I think it's a, it's a really interesting um, element to contend with because you start thinking, all right, when when does Pollard come on? What is his role in games? Is he just coming on to, you know, kick kick penalty goals? Um, you know, so they push ahead by three. Like, is, does he just need to kick penalty goals in the, you know, sixty fifth, sixty eighth, seventy second, seventy seventh minutes? Is that is that his job for the end of it? Um, you know, I he's not going to come on for the box to tighten up their game. I'd I'd reckon that they would feel they don't need to do that late in the game at at that point. So, you know, and then does he play, does he play 10? Does he play 12? Does he play 15? I, I, it's a really, from an out, from the outside looking in, it's a really curious selection because as you say, Pollard has always struck me as a, uh, as a 10 or a not player. He's, um, he was, he was squad member, you know, 33A, as you called him, Harry, last year, he was either in the squad or he was starting or he wasn't in the squad. Yep. So um, he he's still that sort of player to me. So, yeah, it's an interesting move. And I don't really know like how he becomes effective coming off the bench to play 10. Hmm. So I, I don't know. That's, that's a long-winded way of saying I'm not sure. <laughs> I think. Mm. Well, I mean, so it might be the Mornay stain, you know, game three against the Yeah, Lions, and that's, that's what I'm getting just at. Just to come yeah. in and do, uh, yeah. do a job, you know, like he did against England or so forth. But, you know, with a 6-2 bench, with Grant Williams being the everything else, you're going to hold someone back to the very, very, very end if you can. So if Sasha's going well, Sasha, yeah. Sasha believes things working, then you just hold Andre forever. Because you just, he's it's just Pollard's job to come on in the last. He's 10 just your ultimate cover, yeah. So if you use him too early, yeah. and then, uh, then Jesse, you know, breaks a leg, then suddenly you're in trouble. So yeah, you, you, I think Grant is the guy who comes on earlier to um, to be able to get on there, and then he can float anywhere you want. You know, Grant can play every position, yeah, uh, like for real. Uh, whereas Andre Pollard can only play two, max three positions. So yeah. I think yeah, it's it's much of a read the game. I think Andre's probably not bad as well, sitting on. Uh, sitting on the the bench and watching a game and seeing what should be done. I think that did happen in the quarter <laughs> yeah. in the quarterfinal semifinal. Uh, I think that happened. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that's actually a fascinating question. And I would think Joe yeah. Schmidt right now, if he's thinking about something on pen and paper and doing some you know doodles besides the back three issue, I think he might be thinking about this. Like, what can I do? That makes it where you got to put Andre on earlier. <laughs> like that's and that's yeah. that's yeah. That that's actually what I was going to say. To 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 actually think about this as an answer now. The the Wallabies would want to be thinking: What can we do to get Pollard on as soon as like as early as possible? Because that almost certainly forces a shift in the way the box will play. Nailed it. That's a hundred percent. Where, the where, where the Wallabies need to it's be. What, it's what yeah. happened against Ireland in the second uh, test. I mean, we'll never know, and what ifs are what ifs, and, and there's no excuses. Yeah. But when he goes off in the first tackle, um, and suddenly the whole thing is weird. I mean, like the whole thing is weird. Like from that point on, yeah. whatever you were trying yeah. to do wasn't going to work, and you're going to have to win by threes. And you go 18 3 in a, in a good run, get back in the match with Pollard. But it always feels like you're adjusting and accommodating. So I would think the Wallabies yeah. want to make this thing look like where Shawnee Maloney or whoever's commentating going, Oh, the six, two backfired. That's what they want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. May, and, and maybe, and maybe the other way, the other, the other answer to that is if, if Pollard is coming on the 72nd minute with a job to kick two penalty goals to close out a game, that actually means the Wallabies have played an outstanding game to stay with the box too. 
So you don't like, want you don't want the wallabies into the shots. No, that's just, that's what I mean. That that means no. that means they've gone at home. Yeah, they've gone way better than expected. Is is what I would say. Mm. Okay, Harry, how how do you see Saturday unfolding now? Let's let's talk from a book point of view. Let's let's unravel this because we've got that real that amazing pack. We've got that exciting backline. We've got the yin and the yang of Grant Williams and Andre Pollard on the bench, but those Lucys. How how's how's this game going to unfold on Saturday? Do I have to be Perfect honest, or can I just talk cuck? Harry, we don't bring you here do for you... your honesty, my man. <laughs> do you do honesty? <laughs> okay, what I'm what I'm seeing unfold here is um, a dramatic come from behind victory by the underdog box. Uh, in the final 20, <laughs> having having weak tries right and center <laughs> to the almighty Nick Frost and uh, Zane Zongor, Lang Zongor. It'll, it'll never not be funny. Okay, so I, I, <laughs> honestly, though, I mean, unless we're just going to be um, pretend champions and, you know, fake number ones, you would think that this bot team should have a very good first half. And they don't, we don't really start that well nowadays. We actually win games in the second. Yeah. So this would have to be one of those situations you go, look, guys, you just played Ireland in one of the great test series of history. Uh, can you just put on a nice 40 minutes? And if that's true, the, sh- the score should be 12-6 or you know, 15-9 or something like that. And then you rely on this really amazing bomb squad to close it out. That's what should happen if you're betting, if you're setting odds, you would say a gentle seven point margin at the off and then you, you know, take it away to 15 or so in the, in the second. But we know it's Suncorp, we know it's Brisbane, we know it's Australia, we know that our guys right now are surfing, they're chasing stuff around the beach, they are eating strange foods, they're having a good time, they're sleeping well, and they're just not really angry. So uh, it's time for Rossi to pull one of his secret, you know, manipulation techniques you know, your mom lied to me. Like, I don't know. I amp it up. Go to the next level. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys, you've got to take this serious. Australians don't even drink Forex. It's not very good beer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Gents, what what an unbelievable, unbelievable chat. So thank you very much. Brett, can you give us a quick little rundown? So for those of you that don't know, Brett and Harry are on the 8-9 Combo Rugby podcast, and you guys just recently had Paul Scully on to talk about the rugby championship and all that. You can find them on all the amazing platforms. Brett, do you want to give us a quick little run through? Yeah, and I love that you don't trust Harry to do this because <laughs> that's, that's, that's where we could be honest here. Yeah, yeah. Look, had, a, had a great chat with, with, uh, with Paul Cully. We, we did, a, did a deep dive into... Um, not just the squads uh, and, and what we see in that, and that was obviously before the box had named their team as well, um, but just the the interesting little narratives that sit going into this rugby championship. And, and Paul wrote um, in his Sydney Morning Herald column for on Monday that there's this really interesting dynamic now in that there's this the first generation of South African players coming through who've only played in the IRC. There's a generation of Australian and New Zealand players who have only played Super Rugby Pacific and they've not played each other. Mm. And so, you know, that's going to be a fascinating thing to see how it plays out, you know, not just over the next six or eight weeks, but over the next few years, obviously. So um, that's a that's an interesting little narrative and subplot that uh, I have to admit I hadn't thought of. You don't you don't realise that sort of thing until until it's written written like the way Paul did it. So um, that was a great chat. Even last week, we had a great chat with TMO Brett Cronin as well. And, and so many people have got in touch with us to say that they learnt so much about how that process works when that's exactly what we wanted out of a conversation like that, to, yeah. to, to, to get behind the scenes and find out exactly how these things work. So, yeah, do a search for the 8-9 Combo on all the pod platforms. We're across them everywhere. Um, if you're... On Spotify and you subscribe to us, um, you go and find the, the auto download button and make sure you get everything that we do. We'll be back later in the week for, for Games of the Week, our preview. And then on Saturday night at uh, a time yet to be determined, Harry, <laughs> we will be, uh, <laughs> we'll be back to do our, um, our test match postmortems as well, which was, which was fantastic through the, the July test as well. So uh, we're out there everywhere and obviously check our socials and uh, we'll be all across that as well. But um, thanks so much for having us on it's been great to link up with um, with rugby bits again it's been a little while yeah it's been been a while brett thank you so much harry 
I was never ever not going to let you have the last say. You can totally do our sign off. I know I've dropped you dropped you in hot water here, but you're perfectly capable of of nailing it. So from me, goodbye, and Harry's going to sign out from Rugby Bits. Come play with us. <laughs> Hang on, isn't that off ours? Yes. <laughs> unbated, unbated rugby bits with an eight nine combo sign off. Nice. <laughs> I like it.